In this video, I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of classical electromagnetism. So what are the fundamental things that you need to describe all of electromagnetism in the classical sense? Well, you actually just need five big equations. They're the building blocks of all of classical electrodynamics and all of the understanding of classical electromagnetism. So over here, these blue equations are Maxwell's equations in differential form. So you, you might be able to see this upside down triangle that's called the Dell operator or NABLA sometimes. And occasionally it's being, uh, being applied with the cross product. Occasionally it's being applied with the dot product. With the dot product, this is divergence. With the cross product, this is curl. So we have divergence, divergence, curl, curl. And what is E? E is the electric field. What is B? B is the magnetic field. So this tells us how electric fields and magnetic fields behave. What about this equation in red down here? This is the Lorentz equation, or the Lorentz force equation. This Lorentz force equation is sometimes called the electromagnetic force equation. And it tells you how charges respond to electric and magnetic fields. So charges produce electric and magnetic fields, and they can also respond to electric and magnetic fields. This is the, the fundamental uh, understanding of how electromagnetism works. There's these things in the universe called charges. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative. They act as sources for electric fields. And if charges start moving, they can start producing magnetic fields as well. So electric fields and magnetic fields form the basis for all of electromagnetism because they tell the charges how to move. Charges have trajectories in, in three-dimensional space. And if you want to look at the time evolution of a system in electromagnetism, you need to know what the electric fields and the magnetic fields are doing. Let's talk a bit more about these blue equations over here. They are Maxwell's equations. So what is this one over here in the top left? This is Gauss's law for electric fields. Or sometimes it's just abbreviated to Gauss's law. And Gauss's law says that the divergence of the electric field is due to the charge density. Keep in mind, this is just a constant down here, the permittivity of free space. And this guy, the charge density, tells you how much charge there is per unit volume in a region in space. So what this says is the statement that I was kind of conveying before, that charges produce electric fields. So the source of electric fields is charges. If it's a positive charge or a negative charge, it's going to have some kind of electric field emanating from it. That's what Gauss's law is saying. What about this over here? This is a similar form to the electric field, but now we have swapped it out for the magnetic field. This is Gauss's law for magnetism. So Gauss's law for magnetism is an equivalent exp expression for the magnetic field, where instead of ha having the electric field here, now we have the magnetic field. And what is it saying? It's saying the divergence is zero. So what this quantifies is that there's no equivalent charge in magnetism. So there's no magnetic monopole. That's the classical understanding so far. So the classical understanding so far is that there's no uh, sources for magnetic fields uh, in, in, the, in the same way that there are for electric fields. But you can produce magnetic fields by having charges move. So moving charges produce magnetic fields. What's going on in these two equations over here? This one is called Faraday's law of induction. And sometimes this negative sign is qualitatively described by Lenz's law. So Faraday's law of induction or Lenz's law are summarized in this differential form over here. And that's Faraday's law of induction. So this says that the curl of the electric field or how things circulate in three dimensions, that's related to the negative of the partial derivative with respect to time of the magnetic field. What is that saying? That's saying that if you have a changing magnetic field, it's going to produce some rotation in the electric field. So rotating electric fields can be produced by changing magnetic fields. And this minus sign says that they're always going to oppose the change. This circulation will oppose the change in the magnetic field. So that's Faraday's law of induction. What is this final equation here, the fourth equation of Maxwell's equations? This guy is Ampere's circuital law, or sometimes abbreviated just as Ampere's law. It also has Maxwell's modification, and that's the modification for the displacement current. So this guy tells us that the circulation, or the curl of the magnetic field, can be produced in two ways. 
You can either have this J vector, which is the electric current density vector, uh, and that's related to the current, how much current is flowing there. So if you have a current, you can get circulation of the magnetic field. You can also get circulation of the magnetic field if the electric field changes. So changing electric fields, or this partial derivative with respect to time, this changing electric field can induce a circulation of the magnetic field. Exactly the same as what Faraday's law is saying over here. Changing, electric, uh, changing magnetic fields can produce circulations in the electric field. So electric and magnetic fields can circulate around changing electric and magnetic fields. Isn't that spectacular? This B field, if it changes, causes electric fields to circulate around. This electric field, if it changes, causes magnetic fields to circulate around. So that's what Faraday's law of induction and Ampere's circuital law are actually conveying. What about this guy down here? This guy tells us how charges respond to these guys. So how would a charge respond to an electric field? Well, it would just have a scalar multiple by the charge, and that would give us the force. This, this term over here is called the electric force. What about the magnetic contribution? The magnetic contribution, that's called the magnetic force. That's this term over here. That would have, again, your scaling by the charge, but it's not a simple uh, scalar multiplication. Now it's a cross product with the velocity and the magnetic field. These guys form a vector, which is the force vector, when you scale by the charge. And the total force is actually going to be the sum of the electric force and the magnetic force. So what is this actually saying? These blue equations, Maxwell's equations, they summarize how electric fields and magnetic fields behave. This equation over here, the Lorentz force equation, summarizes how point charges respond to electric and magnetic fields. So as a quick summary, this is Gauss's law, this is Gauss's law for magnetism, this is Faraday's law of induction, and this is Ampere's circuital law with uh, Maxwell's addition. These four equations tell you everything you need to know about electric fields and magnetic fields. Electric and magnetic fields tell you how charges are going to move, right? So they exist in 3D space, and they inform the charge on how it's supposed to move because they let them, the charge know that it has to experience a force. That's one way of, of thinking about it. So if a charge is moving, its trajectory is mapped out by electric and magnetic fields. And charges are also responsible for producing electric and magnetic fields. So that is the fundamentals of classical electromagnetism.